relatively new to psychiatry, relatively new for patients who are experiencing malignant mental illnesses that have not responded to conventional treatments. And this has actually been, it's an interesting area insofar as it is an area that the media seems to have taken a tremendous interest in, and it's just about impossible nowadays to not open a New York Times or you know major national, international media and not see a, a discussion or comment about rapid onset treatments for depression. So what I'll do is I'll really, in a pithy way, go through the extant literature as it relates to supporting a claim that some of these treatments may be beneficial, and then I'll summarize where we're at, and then we'll move into the resource that we now have here located on Mavis Road in Mississauga. Okay, so the objectives are, I've articulated them already. Let's in fact, here's my roadmap. Much of the conversation is going to be about depression. This is the entity that's been most studied from the point of view of rapid onset treatments. We'll also then segue into the related but different topic of suicidality. We'll talk about other conditions like anxiety, and then we'll move into some of the safety and tolerability concerns. So this question is obviously, in many ways, not just rhetorical, but you could say, let's skip on. The question really is, why haven't we had new antidepressant treatments? But just to provide a bit of context to this, when we look at suicide, suicide's not depression, but we know at least 50, if not a higher percentage of people who commit suicide have major depressive disorder. Said differently, 85% of all people who commit suicide at the time of suicide have a diagnosable DSM-5 mental disorder. Now, what you can see on the slide here are suicide rates on the right-hand side. You have males, you have females, and you have both sexes. Males in the blue, how characteristic. Uh, females in the yellow, and you have both, I guess, uh, in the orange. Now, what you're seeing is fairly kind of straight lines, and that's true, but you know, the devil is in the detail. And, and what we've learned is, is that there are subpopulations, particularly younger uh, people, where, in fact, suicide rates, in fact, have climbed. Uh, we've seen uh, suicide rates increasing in people between the ages of 45 and 65. And uh, so when I had graduated as a resident, the multiple choice exam stated, which of the following age groups is most at risk of suicide completion? And you were to circle 65 or older. Now the answer is 45 to 65. If we look at the number of suicides across the United States, where there's more updated information, we're seeing that the rate of and the number of people completing suicide completing has been actually increasing. By the way, just on a parenthetical sort of comment here, is that the black box warning around suicidality and antidepressants, it found its way into the product inserts beginning in 2004. And interesting, interestingly, that since 1969, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention out of Atlanta has been tracking suicide across America. And from 1969 until 2004, the suicide rates, rates were going down. And beginning in 2004, they stopped and they started going back up. And you've been seeing the slow increase since 2004 in the United States. We see it in Canada, you see it in Australia, and you see it in the UK. And that is population-based, that's observational, always difficult to say cause and effect from such a macro view. But certainly the uh, use or the non-use of antidepressants in younger people out of concerns of so-called suicidal ideation or suicidal attempts uh, has been put forward as perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing a higher suicide. That is, we're not seeing people with depression and other treatable disorders linked to suicide receiving the appropriate treatment. Now, the slide perhaps is uh, too much detail, particularly after four hours of looking at slides. What's the message? The message is, is that if you are depressed and you have a first episode of depression, and you see a healthcare provider, there's about a 30% chance 
that you're going to have a remission with that treatment. If that one doesn't prove to be sufficient, either because of intolerability and or inefficacy, the next treatment's batting average is around 30%. Then the window starts to close. The possibility that the third intervention, either as an alone or as an adjunct, is going to work is less than 15%. And every clinician knows that. So in other words, there's an 85 to 90% chance that the treatment you're giving the patient, if they've had two prior failures, is going to fail. So in actual fact, this is very common. This was actually the takeaway message from STAR-D. So we have not just a low rate of remission, we have a lower rates of remission as a function of each failed trial of an antidepressant. Now nobody here is happy with the time to onset of antidepressants. And the, the, the message has been for a long time that antidepressants don't work for four to six weeks. That's a canard. That's, that's false. That's not true. Antidepressants begin to exact an effect on brain within one day. But the real question is, is what is the timeline from starting the antidepressant to observing clinically relevant changes in the patient's distress and or function or other patient-centric outcomes? And you could say it's two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, whatever the answer is, it finishes with it's too long, it's not acceptable, we got to do better. So there's ways that we've been thinking about trying to accelerate the onset of treatment and psychiatry is now entering into a time, an epoch, where there's been a lot of interest in so-called rapid onset antidepressants. Now, where is the line between rapid onset versus delayed onset? And I'm going to call a conventional antidepressant delayed onset. Well, the answer to the question is not known. It's a bit like asking how long is a piece of string. So this is going to be an arbitrary line, but we're talking about rapid onset. We're talking about within one day. So I think all of us would have to agree that a clinically relevant improvement in one day is rapid onset. So the treatment that has been around for 40 years and has been used in my clinic many, many times and has been underemphasized as a rapid onset antidepressant is sleep deprivation. I recall a patient that I saw about 10 years ago. He was a very high-functioning person and executive. He was referred to me after he had had an insufficient response to 40 antidepressants and other psychotropic drugs, including CBT, including ECT, and including deep brain stimulation. And he's referred to me, and the question was, what do we do? So we tried all kinds of things. We tried ketoconazole to inhibit his adrenal gland. We tried anti-inflammatories. We tried Yohimbine. We tried to manipulate his encephalinase levels. We tried all kinds of things. I was in chapter 86 of uh, Goodman and Gelman's textbook, trying to find the next strategy for this gentleman. Um, and then, so I said to him, why don't we just sleep deprive you? And we sleep deprived him in 24 hours he was well. And what was interesting, I got a phone call from his wife. He had bipolar disorder. His wife called me up. I, had never, I hadn't seen her. I hadn't seen him now for about a year. Never heard from her. She calls me up, and she's ferocious on the phone. Call me back. So I called her back. I thought maybe she's bipolar as well. Anyhow, so I called her back. And I said, Dr. McIntyre, she goes, I'm furious at you. And I thought, well, OK, uh, what's, uh, what's the fury about? Well. Uh, so-and-so is better, I said, yeah, and now we have to do things as a family. I thought, okay. So I was reminded about the uh, effect on the family and how illness, in fact, is reinforced within family dynamics. That was a whole other story. But the point I wanted to leave you with is sleep deprivation has been with us for a long time, and it is a powerful, powerful tool that I think is underemphasized in the field. Let's move over to ketamine. Ketamine is the drug that has been receiving most of the attention. We're going to finish on time. Don't worry. This I have abbreviated this presentation. So just to give you a bit of a history, ketamine began with a progenitor molecule. And the progenitor molecule was PCP, phencyclidine. The FDA approved ketamine in 1970 um, <clears throat> as a treatment specifically for human use and as a dissociative anesthetic. 
dissociative anesthetic has more than one definition. We understand dissociative anesthetic as an anesthetic that gives you dissociation. That's Socratic, and that's indeed one definition. The actual biochemical definition of dissociative anesthetic is an anesthetic that dissociates brain circuitry processes. That got lost into the history, but that is, in fact, one of the historical definitions of dissociative anesthesia. Now, ketamine is, in fact, an agent that is known to have pleiotropic pharmacology. We like the word pleiotropic. We used to use the word dirty drugs, but dirty just sound dirty, so now we call them pleiotropic. And prior to ketamine, nitrous oxide, in fact, was being used quite commonly as an anesthetic. Here in Toronto, there is a study going on in bipolar depression where patients are receiving nitrous oxide as a treatment for bipolar depression. Nitrous oxide is also a rapid onset glutamate-based psychotropic drug that's being looked at as a potential antidepressant. How does ketamine work? Okay. So when you see a slide like that, how does ketamine work, and you see that slide, you then can conclude we don't know how ketamine works. So that being said, there are, in fact, suspects in the suspect line. So the first suspect would be glutamate. It's an obvious uh, suspect because we know that ketamine targets the so-called ionotropic NMDA receptor. For the last 10 years, we thought that's where all the action was. There's now a hypothesis that that's not really where the action is. You block the NMDA receptor, and effectively, you increase activity at another ionotropic receptor called the AMPA. Maybe the granularity is for another day. Let's just stay with glutamate, and that's certainly one of the targets. The other target, and these aren't mutually exclusive, is monoamines. We know that ketamine can affect, for example, dopamine. And we have plenty of evidence now that ketamine infusion seems to improve measures of reward, thought in part to be related to ketamine. That segues very organically into my next point, and that's opioids. And we know that opioid ergics, or sorry, opioid ergic systems, are also engaged by ketamine. Shouldn't surprise you because ketamine has been used for a long time to treat chronic pain. And I think someone, a colleague had a question around that. So that may be enough for now. Glutamate, monoamines. We also have effects on opiates, but the plot's even thickening greater because we now believe that ketamine has an effect on neurotrophic proteins, like brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Everyone's heard of BDNF, but there's another molecule that's become uh, very, very fashionable in this business. It's called mTOR, the mammalian target of rapamycin. And this is a protein that's involved in a whole host of cellular processes, including, but not limited to, trophic activity, and ketamine has this immediate effect on mTOR, which facilitates plasticity. So, so far, just if you're a pharmacologist and you're seeing this, you're like a, like a Pavlovian dog just starting to salivate. This is very interesting in terms of the opportunity on brain. That being said, we all know uh, well that ketamine has been around for a long time, known on the street as Kit Kat and Special K. This drug's been abused for many, many years with devastating consequences. And ketamine uh, <coughs> has resulted in significant uh, morbidity and mortality. And as well, it can cause very significant cognitive impairment. This is a serious uh, psychotropic agent, of course, being derived from PCP. That being said is that it was also observed when it was being used in pain that many individuals who had pain receiving sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine would report an improvement in a variety of patient-centric outcomes. Less depressed, more optimism, more vigor, more vitality, even better uh, overall function. And then some people said, well, that's not really an antidepressant effect. That's an epiphenomenon because the person's on a trip. And wouldn't you be happy too if you were on a trip? And so that's a reasonable uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, but when you look into the, the, the depths of this a bit more, it turned out that people who were reporting that positive psychiatric outcome were, in fact, not experiencing any dissociation. So these observations, among others, supported by a well-documented pharmacologic database, 
as well as an animal database, gave us reasons to believe that if you administered a sub-anesthetic dose of ketamine, you could alleviate depression in people with malignant depression, people who've had persistent, treatment-resistant, and or chronic depression. So it's, it's persistent, it is treatment-resistant, and it is severe. Those are three separate organisms. And when we refer to sub-anesthetic, what we're referring to is a dose that achieves a blood concentration of about 10% of what's achieved if you went to see your anesthetist for some surgical procedure. So this is truly sub-anesthetic. And that dose typically is a half a milligram a kilogram. So looking at some data here, this is in fact a study that looked at ketamine's effect, and the control group received midazolam, the benzodiazepine. And after infusion, using changes on the mattress score, within one day on the inpatient side, and the patients then switch to the outpatient side, we see a significant between group difference, and we see a significant advantage in favor of ketamine. Now this observation has been, uh, has been repeated, not just at day one and two, but out to day three and out to day seven. It needs to be emphasized that these were persons who typically had failed sufficient you know, antidepressants, six, eight, nine, ten antidepressants, and in many in most cases had also failed electroconvulsive therapy. It would be a very difficult case to argue, in fact, you could not argue, that this was a placebo response. Now, as always is the case, you have standalone studies, and then you try to aggregate the data in a pooled or a meta or a network analysis. And the single infusion studies were then meta-analyzed here just a couple of years ago in the American Journal. And the takeaway is that the odds ratio of success was pretty high, ranging between 6 and 10. So this is a very significant, and it's a replicated effect. So we have a crisis of non-replication in medicine, where it's difficult for one group to replicate the other group's work. Replication is, in fact, the essence of believability here, and this has been shown. So we have a rapid onset effect, we have a robust effect, and we have an effect that's now been replicated. So rapid, robust, and replicated. I should also emphasize that when you think about the dose, the dose is sub-anesthetic. Most protocols have adopted a half a milligram a kilo that achieves a blood concentration around 10% of the anesthesia dose. There's still work underway trying to suss out what is really the exact dose or what's the better dose. I don't think we're going to uh, believe for a moment that there's going to be a one-size-fits-all, but for now the 0 0.5 milligram a kilo has been the working dose, but this uh, effort goes on. When you think about ketamine, there's two paradigms. One is a single infusion, just get it once. The other is multiple infusions. And so very different, single infusion versus multiple infusions. And of course, the drop-down menu is, if it's multiple infusions, how multiple is it? And there's been two paradigms that have been explored, twice a week or three times a week. And the results from these studies gives us reasons to believe that at least for now, there doesn't seem to be a greater overall antidepressant effect in the thrice versus the twice a week. Said differently, both seem to work equally effective. Some clinics in the United States do it three times a week. Some do it twice a week. The evidence doesn't really guide you necessarily to one or the other. But for now, uh, twice a week seems to be sufficient. But, you know, as always, more work is needed. Now, let's talk about bipolar depression. Bipolar depression is more likely to be treatment resistant than is major depressive disorder. We have fewer treatment options. In bipolar depression, we have lorazodone. We have quetiapine, which can cause some weight gain. Uh, we have lithium, which is not as effective in depression as it is in mania. We have lamotrigine. And then after that, we don't have a whole lot more. We have a new agent coming up from the United States, hopefully, called Braylar very soon, but we'll wait and see. But for now, we end up putting these patients on sequences of antidepressants. And to be perfectly frank, over the years, we've had you know, over 100,000 people through my center. I'm frankly fed up of giving people treatments I know don't work. They're not going to work. 
And we try to give people treatments that at least we can believe that they're going to work. But once they have six, seven, eight failures, you know, we're really into what I would just simply describe as palliative medicine. Ketamine's been looked at in bipolar disorder. This was a study published by a colleague at the NIH. It was a small sample, 18 subjects, double-blind crossover trial, adding ketamine, the usual dose, to lithium or valparate. And in this crossover trial, first, prima uh, non nocere, these patients did not exhibit this, uh, psychosis. There was not evidence of mania induction. What was observed is that there was an antidepressant effect and a rapid onset effect noted within 40 minutes. So these are persons who respond to nothing, and they actually responded within 40 minutes. I should highlight that in the bipolar studies, as well as in the MDD, the major depressive disorder trials, what has been consistently reported is a rate of dissociation or dissociative symptomatology of approximately 30% with the first infusion. That reduces by about 25% with the second infusion, a further 25% reduction with the third infusion, and by the fourth infusion, the rate's around 5 to 10%. So there's some type of habituation to the dissociation. The other adverse event that we need to keep in mind when giving sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine is a vasopressor effect. I said a third have dissociation with the first infusion. About a third have vasopressor and or increased heart rate effects. And that tends, again, to habituate over the ensuing four infusions. So we have a body of evidence that's accumulating for the intravenous delivery of ketamine. I want to also mention that oral ketamine is being prescribed by many clinicians here in Ontario for the treatment of depression out of their offices. Oral ketamine has not been studied to the same degree as intravenous ketamine. Moreover, the bioavailability of intravenous ketamine is about 99%. The bioavailability of oral ketamine is around 10 to 30%. I suspect that's probably why oral ketamine has not been as attractive and the evidence has not been as convincing. Let's now talk about suicidal ideation. Now, when we think about suicidality, I want to convey something very clear. The field likes to talk about suicidality. Suicidality is a conflation of suicidal ideation, non-lethal self-harm, and lethal self-harm. And the antidepressants have on their label, antidepressants increase suicidality. The anti-psychiatry and the anti-psychiatric patient movement ran with that. And they ran with that, and they convinced people that antidepressants increase suicide. That's not what the label says. Antidepressants do not increase suicide. They increase suicidal ideation and non-lethal self-harm broadly defined. Everyone here who sees patients who are reporting suicidality knows that ideation and non-lethal self-harm and lethal self-harm, they are not synonyms. Those are very, very different uh, 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 phenotypes. That being said, let's talk about suicidal ideation. This was just um, published in the American Journal. This was a patient-level data, was a pooling of available studies looking at ketamine's effect on suicidal ideation. Perhaps we should just set the stage slightly here. Don't we have treatments for suicidal ideation? We have some. We have treatments that have been shown to reduce suicide. That's lithium and clozapine. What about dialectical behavioral therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy? Cognitive behavioral therapy reduces suicide attempts. Dialectical behavioral therapy reduces suicide attempts and maybe suicide completion. The preponderance of evidence would unequivocally support lithium and clozapine. When you look at the data here out to a week, what you're seeing within one day is clinician-rated, uh, patient-rated measures of suicide ideation significantly reduce within one day. Looking at controlled trials, we're seeing this sustained out to 7 to 14 days, in some cases up to 6 weeks, depending on the trial. Some might ask, well, isn't the anti-suicide effect expected if you're an antidepressant? Well, very few agents have shown a specific anti-suicide effect. And the evidence indicates, and that previous study I showed you showed, that the anti-suicide effect is dissociable from the antidepressant effect. Johnson & Johnson is developing an intranasal delivery of 
ketamine. That's the isomer S-ketamine. And this intranasal delivery has now shown replicated evidence of efficacy of rapid onset effects, particularly people under 65. There's still dose explor uh, exploration going on. And this is an intervention that patients would just simply take uh, you know, by, uh, by nose. They spray it in their nose. And there's an ongoing academic debate. Is it the racemic mixture that's most effective, ketamine, or is it the isomer? And is it the metabolite, norketamine? These debates will keep going on. But I want you to know that in addition to the intravenous, we have this intranasal formulation. And the formulation intranasal is also being looked at vis-a-vis -vis from the point of view of anti-suicide. And we have now evidence that's in accordance with what we saw with intravenous ketamine, that being that there could be a reduction in suicidality. More for your interest, there's a new combination pill that's been patented. It's the combination of D-cycloserine, which is a glutamate drug through the glycine system that's been combined. You know, cycloserine was a, an old drug for TB. And this drug is glutamate targeting, and it's been combined with lorazodone. And there's a study underway giving individuals with severe bipolar depression ketamine therapy, and if they benefit, then they're switched over to this combo pill. So in addition to thinking about rapid onset, there's efforts underway now to look at how can we sustain this effect in the longer term. And it may or not be ketamine. It may be other drugs alone or in combination that continue to engage this glutamate system. So we have effects on ideation. We have effects on depression. And intranasal ketamine was granted breakthrough therapy designation from the FDA. So that clearly speaks to the anticipation that this, in fact, could offer patients something very different. I'm not going to go through the other indications with a lot of detail, because I would say that the evidence for this is either not there or is certainly a work in progress very early. Just for your interest, generalized and social anxiety, PTSD, OCD, the data has been mixed. We're seeing some lines of evidence, for example, in generalized anxiety disorder. There's been some lines of evidence in the area of social anxiety disorder. And the lines are going where we want them to go, but it's very small studies, you know, 10, 15, 20 patients at most, largely uh, um, you know, early stage development. But just more for your interest, many in the room would know that ecstasy is now under development as a treatment for post-traumatic stress. It's ecstasy with psychotherapy, and that's a, a study supported by the U.S. government. And uh, ketamine has also been looked at in the area of PTSD, as well, finally, in OCD. So just to kind of round the basis, other conditions are being looked at, but the preponderance of evidence is really in major depression, bipolar depression, as well as in uh, suicidality. We talked about some of the safety concerns, dissociation in cardiovascular. There's other side effects. Ketamine bladder, for those who have seen patients who abuse ketamine, these are patients who have kidney and or ureter and or bladder bleeding due to excessive ketamine ingestion. We don't know if this affects patients that we're giving because it's, it's a significantly lower dose, but that's something that uh, we counsel patients on. Um, we know that ketamine abuse is anti-cognitive. What's interesting is that sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine seem to be pro-cognitive. So like many things in life, it's going to depend on the dose uh, rather than a one-size-fits-all outcome with this particular treatment. So let me, if I can now, just get to a consensus statement. This is obviously a very new area. And there still needs to be a lot of consideration given to patient selection, a lot of consideration given to informing patients. I don't think the New York Times should be the resource. They need to, in fact, have, uh, I think, obviously, accurate information conveyed by a multi disciplinary uh, task uh, force and a group uh, 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 task force. Across the United States, there's no shortage of entrepreneurial zeal in the United States. And in the United States, we've seen an uptick in the number of ketamine clinics. There's about 85 now across America that are offering ketamine as a treatment for treatment-resistant depression and bipolar. An informal survey of many, if not most, of these clinics indicates that most are not being operated by mental health care providers. They're being operated by anesthetists. And I would say that that's probably not sufficient as part of an overall comprehensive care of the patients. 
Some of these clinics do not even have ongoing cardiovascular monitoring, safety monitoring, which is obviously is very concerning. And so I think that there needs to be uh, obviously tremendous attention being paid to this. Um, just for your interest, Allergan, who's one of our sponsors today, has a ketamine-like product in the sense that it affects the glutamate system, its rapid onset in its antidepressant effects, but it doesn't seem to have dissociation and doesn't seem to have the hemodynamic effect. And instead of an infusion over 40 to 45 minutes, this is given as a 90-second push. This obviously has tremendous attraction to us. This product is in late stage three development, and we're going to be actually testing this here in our Mississauga program. For the purpose of completion, scopolamine, we all know scopolamine. What's it doing here? Well, scopolamine indirectly affects glutamatergic signaling. It increases messenger RNA expression in glutamatergic containing neuronal systems. And interestingly enough, the infusion of scopolamine has been shown to be a rapid onset antidepressant in treatment resistant depression. I know it's been a long morning. Some are getting hypoglycemic. And some might be thinking, does he got magic mushrooms on there? That is actually psilocybin. That is the active moiety that is in magic mushrooms. And there is, in fact, been a renewed look at psychedelics in general, including ecstasy, obviously ketamine, which is not really a psychedelic, but it has potential psychotomatic effects. And psilocybin, interestingly enough, has now been looked at in some academic studies in depression, where it's now been shown to cause a resynchronization of abnormal brain circuit, which we call something wrong with the topology. So the brain is in a circuitry called the topology circuit, and that's abnormal in depression, and psilocybin seems to correct that. So for your interest, there is an academic study that we are embarking on here at our center, which will be a single infusion of psilocybin, along with six hours of ongoing CBT as a treatment, rapid onset, for the treatment of depression. We're seeing some very interesting results in terms of the effect of psilocybin on cognitive biases, which is, of course, ubiquitous in people with depression. So what are some of the considerations? The considerations are, what is the appropriate patient? And the appropriate patient is someone who has major depressive disorder or bipolar disorder insufficiently responding to conventional approaches. Patients who are experiencing psychosis would not be appropriate at this time. Patients who are having suicidality would certainly be appropriate. The other part is, if a patient has a history of ketamine abuse, they probably should not be considered candidates for this particular approach. The center that is offering this needs to be a center that is not only equipped with mental health uh, expertise, but also primary care expertise, nursing expertise, as well as anesthesia expertise. And above all else, you would want that center to be close to a major hospital. So we, in fact, uh, have started the Canadian Rapid Treatment Center of Excellence. It's on Mavis Road. You can see the, UR, the website URL. The CPSO has just given us their blessings to start Canada's first ever center for rapid onset treatments in major depression. It's been almost a year process. The clinic exists at Mavis Road down by Dundas. Um, we're just getting a number of operational issues in, uh, in, uh, in, in order. Um, and uh, we're, in fact, beginning to take referrals. And you can refer people to the, uh, via the website. The website URL is there. And the website is literally uh, under construction. So it's a bit like moving into a house that's not fully completed. Uh, you, you know, the kitchen's not done and the living room's not finished. But as long as the toilet and the shower works, I can live in there. Uh, this is, in fact, a website still under development. And so, but we do have, in fact, um, the referral portal there that you can use. And we are looking at first patients in the clinic uh, mid-June. So with that, I'm going to stop and just let you know that at the center, there's going to be clinical opportunity. There's going to be research opportunity. And the research opportunities, of course, are protocol dependent. To preempt the question that always comes up is, who's paying for this? And who's paying for this, unfortunately, is not the Ontario government. So at this current time, the, uh, uh, the, the model for now is that this will be a patient pay. And at this point in time, the uh, cost of this intervention 
is looking at approximately five to six hundred dollars per infusion times four infusions. You can do the math. And that is, in fact, the flow through cost to pay for the expertise in the clinic. And the clinic's mandate is to take the profit back into the research. So it will not be a chipotle where you're making burritos 100 a minute like they do in the United States. This is, in fact, going to be a low volume but high quality center of excellence. And I just want to let you know that uh, because that's the model for now. For me as an advocate in this area, we are looking at other models of payment and we're in discussions with a variety of organizations. It would in fact uh, fall short of my objectives if this treatment is not in fact made available to everybody, even those who can't pay. But for now, uh, it's quite to be quite frank, we have to pay the talent to come on in and do this and we got it's just a flow through cost. So I'll stop there.